Okay, my name is Ronald Ops. I'm also from Pivotal. Uh, I'm also a data scientist. And um, <clears throat> today I'm actually going to uh, present to you a live demo of a connected car prototype we built. Uh, if it actually works, I think it will be one of the most exciting talks here at PyData, if it works. And it's certainly the only talk that will have uh, potential for uh, bodily harm and manslaughter, I imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> I won't need to be uh, introducing Pivotal, Alex has already done so, so I'll just uh, switch ahead. Everything I'll be uh, presenting today is actually available as open, open source code, so I'll be sharing this deck later on and you can download all the code. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask them. So, um, <clears throat> how, how did this project come about? So uh, we did a really, really cool customer project, and uh, <clears throat> it had it had all the great aspects of a, of an IoT uh, IoT project. We had uh, ingestion of a lot of uh, fast data. We had a large number of um, <clears throat> of clients in the network, and we had uh, some real time data science on a, uh, displayed on a dashboard. But sadly, this was uh, covered by an uh, ironclad NDA, so there is no no way we can show this. So uh, we got thinking, what can we do about this? Um, uh, <clears throat> and we came up with the connected car. It's, uh, everybody is familiar with a car. It's a very relatable concept. And the pieces, they're really all the same. So uh, we have the same technology as in this client project. We are using Spring XD for data ingestion and streaming. I'll talk more about that later. We use Hadoop for storage. We use uh, Python for the data analytics part. And we use uh, Gemfire, uh, which is also open source now as Project Geode as a, as a data cache layer, which is an uh, in-memory database, by the way. And we're using HTML and JavaScript for the dashboard. So we came up with two, two use cases for this. One is to predict the destination of the driver based on his historical driving behavior <coughs> in real time. And a second, uh, the second use case is so once we've actually predicted that destination, we'll be able to very accurately predict the range, uh, the remaining range of that particular fill of gas. So a quick architectural overview. We start with the car. The data is made available via the OBD2 port of the car. Um, every car since the 1990s uh, has this port. You can plug a Bluetooth OBD2 dongle in this port. And um, <clears throat> we then built an iOS app, we called it Herbie, that connects to this Bluetooth dongle and streams the data, streams the data uh, to a server in the cloud coming off of the car. And from there, we are able to display our results on a dashboard. So <clears throat> let's go to the live demo part of this talk now. I really do hope uh, we can get a stable connection. Uh, enough of you have uh, actually gotten off the Wi-Fi, so I can get a decent connection to my colleague here. OK. Well, let's try this again. Okay, we'll give him a ring here. Let's try FaceTime this time. Okay. Hello, Ferras. Hello. Oh, it's not looking good. I think I'll try Skype one more time. Otherwise, you will just have to... Uh, Drive without a video feed, I'm afraid, if we can make this work. I'll, I'll try Skype. Maybe I can also tether, but I'm not getting a good network in here. Well, let's give Skype another go. Hey again. Oh, hello, Ferris. Hey, is it working this time? Yes, yes, now we can finally hear you. The video, the video is very, uh, very spotty, but we can hear you. Okay, good, good news. Yes. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll just start right away, right? Yes, please go ahead. Cool. So uh, my name is Ross. Uh, that's part of the. <laughs> oh, this is not. 
<laughs> Sorry, Ferris, the connection is... is the connection is... Oh, dear. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, the connection is fairly... The connection is fairly horrible, actually. I, I believe it would be good if you just uh, if you just started driving. We can hardly hear you. Yeah. Well, we need a we need a yeah. I'm connected to Beta House. Inner Space was much slower, but uh, we can. Yes. Okay. Okay, we're a better house guests now. Is it this time better? Yes, it's it's a little better. Okay, um, uh, if that doesn't work, I still have a second of the truck from the other one. Yeah. The I'll try. I'll try the phone, huh? Let's try the phone. I'll put him on speakerphone. Let's see if that works. No, there's no network cable around here. We have a dashboard here. Hello, Ferras. Yeah, that's the the internet. The internet is too slow. So maybe we can talk to you on the phone. Well, yeah, okay, good. Um, we will come then. Is that the internet at your place, or is it my internet? Because I have another phone. I'm not sure. I'm not. Sure. Oh yeah, good idea. Yes. Okay, I plugged you in here now in the main uh, thing here. Please go ahead again. Yes. Car to the back end, and uh, yeah, I think I'm I'm gonna just move on and uh, yeah, and, just uh, start, start just get yeah. So by now you should be able to see some some data presented. Let me reload the page here. Have a look. Give us a second, please. We have no... Ooh, no. Let me try a different. Yes, now, now we're getting some... Yes, okay, why don't you rev up your car so we can see that we're getting some real-time data. So, so you can see the RPM yeah, here I'll, displayed. I'll make some noise. Yes. Give us 3,000, 3,000 RPMs. Yes, this will make the greens happy. <laughs> okay, it's looking good. We're, we're getting some real-time data. I was really starting to uh, worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, why don't, you, why don't you tell us where you want to go today? So, well, I'm here right now at, at Prenzlauer Berg. Uh, that's, that's the place I live. And uh, yeah, I, I have uh, many destinations I could go to today. So uh, basically, if I want to be creative, I could go uh, to a place called uh, St. Oberholt, you may know that, and work on my business ideas. And if I want to relax, I could go to uh, Folks Park, for instance, which is also not far away from here. Uh, there is the Beta House. You know, might know, might know that place where I can go and uh, develop uh, my applications and hack a little bit. And of course, uh, there's also other locations such as the weekend where I can party with tourists. And if I want to go really hard, do the real burden style, I could go to places such as Berghain or Watergate. So these are my destinations today. Excellent. Okay. So, yep. Let's get started then. 
please do. See me moving around. Yeah, we can. No, not yet. Start, start. Uh, are uh, yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really able to turn around now. Okay. Uh, there's some traffic. Uh, it's, uh, Just give me a few seconds. Eh? <laughs> yes, it's, you can't yes, really we'll do that. Traffic in Berlin. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, so in the in the meantime, right I'll explain. Now. Yeah. I'm moving right now. Oh, okay. So yeah, finally he's, he's taking off. So this is all in real time. It's not pre-recorded. Uh, as you can see, as you as you probably believe me, so much has gone wrong. This is all uh, <laughs> this is all real time data. So let me explain the dashboard a little bit. It actually supports multiple vehicles. So up here you can support uh, you can select the VIN, the, the vehicle identification number of that car. So uh, at the moment uh, we are, we are only following one car here. Um, the dashboard, uh, it's only displaying a subset of the data we're getting from the OBD2 port. Uh, you can see here the speed, the RPM, we have the coolant temperature, we're also, getting the, uh, we're also getting the fuel level of the car. But the, really the more interesting pane here is this one. Uh, where we can see one, the, the predicted range, so uh, how much longer can the car actually go. And um, the most interesting piece here is uh, we have actually all these possible destinations uh, Ferris told us about, and we get a probability distribution over these uh, destinations here that gets updated every second. So as he's driving in real time, these probabilities, they get updated. I'll t tell you m more about that later, how these models actually work. They're, they're all implemented in Python. So yeah, at the moment uh, the model believes he's, he's um, going with a 59% probability to to uh, Sankt Oberholz, for example. Okay, so uh, let me switch back here to the presentation and talk a little bit more about the technical specifics of how all this works. Okay, <clears throat> so how all does all this work? Right, we start in the car. Um, since the end of the 90s, every car uh, comes with a, a OBD2 port. It stands for Onboard Diagnostics Port. You can plug a dongle into it and um, uh, then, then you can get uh, sensor data off of the car in, in 200 millisecond intervals. You can get RPM, you can get speed, you can get things like the mass airflow rate, the uh, uh, temperature of various uh, places in the engine and so on. Now we thought, how can we get this data off of the car? We had our co uh, colleagues at Pivotal Labs who focus on app development uh, develop a mobile app for us. Uh, we call it Herbie. And uh, this app is able to connect to the Bluetooth dongle and stream data off of the car into a server in the cloud. And we also enrich the data with GPS data from the phone, acceleration data, and and the bearing. So not only are we streaming data off of the car, but also off the phone. And we use the serial network to stream it into the cloud. This is... Uh oh, this is very horrible, horrible, uh horrible contrast. You can't see anything, can you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Okay, well, this is... Uh this, in theory, is a, is a JSON blob of the data we're getting. <laughs> pretend, pretend it's there. Ah, well. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the way this works is uh, we're sending the data via TCP sockets over Bluetooth to the app, and then uh, via HTTP post over cellular to the server in the cloud, and from there to the dashboard. So, how does the, server, uh, how does the software on the server look like? We're using Spring XD which stands for Extreme Data. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, it comes from a Spring team, but it has very little to do with Java, so you don't need to use Java, uh, you don't need to know Java to use this. It actually uh, supports Python processors, which we're using. It's a really, really cool uh, project for streaming data analysis, and I'd really encourage you to have a look. You can just uh, brew install it uh, if you have the right tap, and it works out of the box. It's a very interesting project. Um, <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about uh, Spring XD in the context of this uh, um, project. Um, we're ingesting the data into Spring XD and um, we're storing it both in Hadoop and in Jamfire. So, the, so we're basically breaking up the stream and storing it in two places. Jamfire for the real-time part and Hadoop for later the, for the batch analytics, right? 
uh, <coughs> and Jamfire is then able to feed this dashboard. And Spring XD handles the data ingestion, the data orchestration, it handles the data extraction and the real-time analytics part. Now, uh, Spring XD uh, has a distributed runtime, uh, so it can run on multiple servers, uh, and it scales really well. Uh, we've, we've done this at the client. It scales to thousands and thousands of vehicles streaming large, large amounts of data every second. Uh, and it has a streaming and a batch engine. You can control Spring XD via a console, which you can also not see <laughs> here, and, and it, but it has a dashboard as well, so you, you, can get a, you get a sort of a graphical user interface you can use. Now, uh, Spring XD is uh, modeled after the Unix shell. So, for example, here, this is a simpler ver version of what we're actually using. So you have a HTTP source, then you have a pipe, it's like a Unix pipe, then you apply a filter to it, so in this case, we're cleaning up the data a bit, uh, managing it slightly. Uh, then we're enriching the data from the, um, <coughs> with the data from the cell phone. And um, then we can pipe it to some shell module. In our case, we're using Python for the analytics. And then we save the results on HDFS for later analysis. So this is a simplified pipeline on how this would look like. What you can also do what you can also do is uh, you can create something called taps. Taps come from wiretapping, what our friends at the NSA, uh, NSA do. So uh, you can actually break up a stream and uh, send it to multiple places. So in our example, like I mentioned, we're saving the data in HDFS, but we also want to do some real-time stuff like display it and so on. So uh, what we do here is uh, we create this tap here with this sign, and we're able to then also send it to, uh, to Gemfire instead of just HTFS, which was our cache, cache layer. Okay, shall we check in with uh, Ferras and see how he's doing? Ferras, are you still there? Let's see where you're, where you're heading to. Yes, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still there. Excellent. Let's, let's have a look where you're... Oh, okay. So you're you're almost at Alexanderplatz. So the model, the model here uh, believes now uh, there's a high prob well, a 40 47 percent probability of him going to going to the weekend club. What's interesting, what you can see here. Uh, so destination number two here. Uh, oh, oh, the the oh, it went here again. Oh, it's cutting off the side of the screen. Okay, sorry about that. Also the other side here. Okay, it's not 16 to 9. Anyway, okay. So what's interesting here, the model uh, correctly inferred that he's driven past these two destinations here. So destination number two and destination number one, which was the Volkspark and uh, St. Oberholz. So these, has become, these, these have become very unlikely. So if we look now here, destination number two is at 0% and destination number one is at 1%. Uh, so now it also just dropped to zero. So the model quite correctly inferred that uh, if he would have driven to either of these two destinations, then we, he would have uh, taken a different road earlier on. Huh? Now, now only these, these destinations are still in play. At the moment, for some reason, uh, the model believes that he's very likely to go to a uh, weekend club, which is, uh, oh, yeah, I guess uh, Ferris likes to party. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the uh, presentation. It must be said, uh, we recorded these journeys yesterday, so this is all on real historical data. And the more journeys you record, the more accurate the model becomes. Hence, it's a, it's a little bit jumpy uh, because we don't have uh, that many drives, of course. But uh, just for, the, for this presentation, we recorded some, some drives in this area. Okay, so let's get back here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> So um, the way this works is uh, the data comes in via HTTP from the app. We apply some transformers to it, and then we stream it into the Python. So the Python part uh, has some models, and these models generate the predictions for the destination and the range. Yeah, And the output gets stored in two places. One is HTFS, and one is the Gemfire tab to be displayed on real time on the dashboard via the REST API. Now the interesting part is, 
we train the models in PySpark. So this is the Python API of Spark, which is sitting on top of Hadoop. And we periodically train these models. And then the models from, from PySpark here, they get sent back into the Python process. So the Python process is using an updated model. <clears throat> and, all these, uh, and all these parts in green, we had to code something for, but all the other parts, actually Spring XD handled these out of the box for, for the Hadoop part, for the jam file tab, and for all the, all the connections we had to write zero code. So this is all handled by Spring, Fire, uh, by Spring XD, which I think is a, that's why it's a really interesting project. Um, let's talk a bit about the data science. So how does the data science part of this work? The first use case is predicting the journey, and the second one is predicting the range based off of the uh, journey prediction. Well, let's define a journey. What is a journey? A journey starts the moment you switch on your car, and it ends once you switch it off again. So if you drive, say, from home to work, that, that I consider that one journey. And we're basically trying to predict whether you are on that journey. So how does this work? By collecting lots of historic data, we're able to generate a sort of driving behavior fingerprint of these kinds of journeys. And um, so given this fingerprint, we're able to uh, then, <clears throat> then, oh, this all looks very horrible. Then uh, we can compare this fingerprint to your current drive and see which, which which journey is the most likely journey that you're on now. So we can actually only predict journey, journeys you've been on previously. We don't predict new journeys. Um, how, does these, how do these journeys look like? For example, these are some uh, other journeys we've recorded in Berlin. So uh, for example here, this is, this is one journey in one color, then we have another journey here, another journey in, in green, another one in blue. And um, now, <clears throat> we are actually uh, we actually have a pipeline of three models uh, to make all this work. So uh, the first step is to generate journey clusters because if you just store this store this data in HDFS, there's really no way at all we can uh, say to HDFS, okay, give me all the journeys from work to the gym, for example. We'll just not know which, which of these journeys uh, to get. So to be able to give this sort of semantic meaning to a journey, we, uh, we run a clustering algorithm of a, on, on all the journeys, on all the recorded journeys. So we're then able to extract a given, a given journey cluster. And this looks like this. So here we, we, we have a map of Berlin again. And uh, this, for example, is a journey cluster start, and this is a journey cluster end. Uh, we used k-means on these models. And we used uh, k-means to, to model this, and it works, worked surprisingly well out of the box. And it is able to identify all the, all the relevant uh, journey clusters. Um, <clears throat> and once we have these clusters, these serve as labels to the supervised learning models downstream. And um, so once we've generated these labels, we, we then have a second model that generates an initial prediction the moment you turn on your car. Because um, if you think about it, all the sensor data that is coming off of this OBD2 port, the moment you turn on the car, it's more or less always going to be the same. So it carries very little information we can predict where you're going. But we're actually using... Um, the time of day, day of the week, and you're starting GPS coordinates to generate a good initial prediction of where you're going. So for example, a good example would be um, <clears throat> if you are at home and it's a weekday and it's a morning you're very, and you start your car, it's very likely that you'll be driving to work probably. So that would be a good initial guess for a model uh, to make. And so that's exactly what we do. And for example here, for, for the data uh, we recorded, we can see the, uh, prob um, the probability of driving from home to work. So on the y-axis, we have the probability, and on the x-axis, if, the, if it's the uh, minute of the day. And you can see that in the morning, the probability of the model uh, is very high that you're, you're driving to work, and then it drops during the day until it's almost zero. And the opposite is true from, for driving from work to home. And the probability then suddenly starts rising in the evening. And um, 
based on this uh, this uh, prediction, we're then <clears throat> able able to predict the range. So we can say, okay, given that you're going to work, we know how you behaved on this particular uh, journey previously, how much fuel you used. We can then pretty accurately say, okay, you have that much range remaining. It's not so important for petrol cars, but for electric cars, it becomes extremely important. And the third step of this is that we update the model, this initial prediction we updated in real time. And, um, and we do so by, uh, by comparing all the sensor data that streams into the, all the other journeys, all the other journey clusters that we have labeled, and then we assign a probability distribution over these journey clusters. So that is what we actually see on the dashboard. So this initial prediction gets slowly faded out and the uh, online predictions become more and more important as more sensor data streams in. This is an example of such a prediction here. Again, you can hardly see it, but uh, what you get here is uh, basically, this is just one prediction. Eh? Um, it gives you the, the end location coordinates of that prediction, uh, how, much, uh, how much fuel you used on these type of journeys previously, and the probability. Okay, so let's recap the architecture here. We start with a phone. The data streams into Spring XD. We persist this data into Hadoop. We use Spark, PySpark for batch training. And then we push these models back into Spring XD in this Python process where they get evaluated in real time. And we push the results out back out to the dashboard. So how do we actually use uh, Spark? We don't use MLlib, but we use Spark to drive uh, parallel scikit-learn processes. We do this because um, because we don't actually have one very big model where MLlib would be suitable, but we have many small models because for each car, for each vehicle, we have a different model. So we can do this in data parallel and we just, we just use Spark to drive scikit-learn. And uh, we don't use Spark streaming. Excuse me, was there a question? No, okay. Okay, when we don't use Spark streaming because Spark streaming uh, just supports mini batches. It doesn't support real, true, real-time streaming use cases like this one. And then we push the results back out onto the dashboard. Well, let's quickly check here where Ferras is currently and see how the models how the models are doing. In in if if the internet would have worked nicely, we we would have gotten uh, some um some uh, real-time video feeds, of course. Okay, so now we can see that Ferris is here uh, just crossing the uh, river Spree. And um, what we can also beautiful see... Area right here. Hello, what did you say? I'm saying it's a beautiful area around here. Oh, that's wonderful, yes. And what's interesting here, so the model has correctly excluded destination number four weekend where, where Ferris goes to uh, dance and meet tourists. So here this, this, this destination has uh, gone to zero. And even though yesterday we only recorded a few drives, the model is still, be, uh, still able to fairly accurately uh, produce these estimates, as we can see. And now the only two possible destinations uh, the model still considers likely is uh, Beta House, actually where we are here, Destination zero and destination number five, which is the Watergate Club here. Uh, probably maybe Ferris wants to go to a after hour. So yeah, we can see him approaching here. And um, as he approaches here, a uh, beta house or or the weekend, uh, or sorry, or Watergate, we should see either of these uh, destinations also dropping to zero and then the probability of the last remaining destination should uh, go to 100%. And the more data we actually collect, the more likely and the more accurate these models will become. And so let's just watch him a little more because this is quite an interesting point here. We can see uh, where he's actually going to now, which destination will pan out. We can see that uh, now Watergate, uh, destination number five here is dropping in probability, whereas uh, Beta House is actually rising in probability. Now we can see that the model is actually predicting uh, Beta house with almost now 100% probability. And this is all happening in real time. This is not pre recorded. This is a real machine learning model. And um, yeah. Okay, we can. Uh, so it looks like uh, Ferris is actually going to Beta house. Yes, Ferris? Were you planning this all along? Well, Why? You got me. 
Why, why didn't you tell me about this? <laughs> I'm coming to visit you guys. Oh, fantastic. Keep some beer, beer cold and fresh for me. Okay, I'll do that. I'll reserve a beer for you. We'll go, we'll go to Watergate later. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, Farah. See you, see you in a little bit. Okay, so we can actually see he's, he's gotten to a beta house and the model uh, corrected it, uh, predicted it correctly. Now let me switch back to the presentation. How am I doing in time? It's 50-50. Okay. Got a couple of minutes. Right. And then we stream this to the dashboard, right? And how does the dashboard uh, work, right? Uh, it uses Gemfire as a, as a in-memory database, as a cache backend. Uh, we, uh, we talk to, the dashboard talks to Gemfire via its REST API. Uh, we, we generated the dashboard with Yoman and AngularJS. And um, all this architecture really, really scales. So for this client project, which was under NDA, we actually had uh, around 100,000 uh, uh, 100, devices all streaming data. Yeah, there was millions of messages per minute. And, um, <clears throat> and we've uh, got uh, per minute over 100 gigabytes. So this is, this is a framework that can really, really scale. But there's also some issues with uh, with uh, Internet of Things. So one was uh, one huge issue issue is uh, compatibility. Every car vendor uh, implements uh, this OBD2 standard slightly different. So for every car we've done this with, there were some data problems, and we we we, we had to adapt the whole thing again and and um, create some exceptions. So it's really not standardized at all. And I think this also applies to other areas of IoT. You have this in a connected home. You have this in a lot of different areas that really devices they just don't. There's no standard for anything. That's a big challenge. And um, also connectivity. Uh, you don't always uh, you don't always have very good uh, cellular reception. Uh, data throughput can be expensive. There's uh, there are also security and privacy concerns. So uh, especially in Germany, uh, it was fine for us to record this data and experiment uh, experiment with it. But uh, uh, if we re recorded everybody's data, we had to really be concerned: is it secure? Is it is it uh, is it uh, not accessible by uh, any malicious uh, intruders? Um, so yeah, let's let's look a bit into the future. Uh, one step we're working on is uh, deploying this on Cloud Foundry. It's uh, our, our platform, uh, our platform as a service, which uh, Alex introduced in the in the last talk. I'll briefly recap. It's it's uh, something like Heroku, except you can host it yourself if you want to on premise, and it's also open source. It's governed by a foundation, and um, <clears throat> it's really it's it's aspiring to be the the operating system of the cloud. And uh, you can push apps to it. You can scale apps seamlessly, and and we really want to port this demo to to work on Cloud Foundry, to be able to scale and deploy it even better. Some additional use cases we're working on uh, and thinking about are uh, one fleet management. So uh, as this scales to thousands and thousands of cars, it can be used uh, for a fleet of cars or trucks to be able to monitor them, apply predictive maintenance to these uh, to the, to this fleet, uh, see the status of the fleet, uh, are there any error codes and so on coming from the engines. Uh, this then can be used for predictive maintenance, for example. Another area is uh, accident assistance. So uh, we can also sense, of course, if there's a prompt stop or damage to the car, uh, it's also possible to alert the... Okay, Ferris hang up on me. Uh, that happens fairly often. Oh, say hello to Ferris. <laughs> he made it. Hi, Ferris. Yes. <laughs> okay, and that's actually perfect timing because uh, now I'm on to questions. Any questions? Yes, please. No, it doesn't know about the... Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so the question was... Uh, how does the mod does the model know about the road uh, network? And the answer is no, it does not. Um, 
the way it works is for the initial prediction and the online prediction, so the prediction we use when the data is streaming in, we use the random forest algorithm. And the random forest algorithm, if you feed it GPS data, is actually able to, um, to sort of bisect the map quite well and build its own sort of uh, understanding of a, of, a road of a road network. So this is, but it has no explicit knowledge of the road network, no. Yeah, real-time traffic data is, is also a very uh, use case we're thinking about. Although we, we have to remember this is, uh, this is not supposed to be a product, but a technical demo for us. So, so there's some, some limitations to the, to the features and time we can, we can spend of it. Okay, yes, please. Okay, I'll re repeat the question. So tomorrow is a talk about Spark, but what is my experience with Spark? So uh, our team, we've, we've started using Spark recently uh, quite a bit. Um, it's a very interesting technology, but uh, it's still somewhat immature, especially the Python API. It produces uh, some uh, out-of-memory errors sometimes, and uh, on operations it shouldn't. Uh, like uh, joins, for example. So, um, so it can be a little bit, a uh, bit of finicky to tune all the parameters and so on. Um, there's another very interesting project here in Berlin called uh, Apache Flink, which uh, is supposed to solve this memory issue because it's, uh, it has, they wrote their own memory manager. Uh, we're very curious to try this out as well. Uh, it's a direct competitor to Spark, and, the, and, and Flink also supports uh, real streaming as opposed to just mini batches. So, yeah, but it's still also a very immature project. So we'll see. Any more questions? Okay. Hi, uh, I'm interested for knowing like what kind of features did you also consider for the destination prediction task i see that you were using this uh, the schedules and the uh, gps coordinates and um, anything else that you thought about or that might have worked or yes so the question is uh, what other features did we think about um uh, so besides all the sensor data uh, we're getting from uh, from the car and the uh, gps data and acceleration data uh, from the phone uh, what would really be, of course, interesting is to do something like Google Now, pull in calendar entries and so on, uh, get other metadata, pull, pull in weather data, pull in traffic data, pull in people's, uh, people's uh, task list or something like this, run text mining on it to, to get more external data than just uh, data from the car. But uh, we, we've done sort of a self-experiment and, and, and played around this uh, a bit with ourselves and the models. Actually, people, people are animals of habit and they usually go on the same routes. And so the model is actually quite good at predicting uh, where you're going to go. Okay, we have time for one more question. It's actually created. Um, you mentioned that you are having a model per driver or per car. Yes. Uh, uh, why not just aggregating? And using uh, basically a, uh, makes of the car or drivers as a as a feature. Uh, because every because uh, we really we create these unique uh, fingerprints of of driver behavior to compare this to, and and people behave different on different routes uh, and to different destinations. So um, it, I think we'll lose a lot of information if we just aggregated everybody into one model. I, not really, because you have the feature. You can have the feature. You know who's driving. You know the the mark of the, the make of the car, etc. Because at the end, it's the same roads, right? Yeah, that is that is somewhat true. You can you can have a global model, but then also the number of destinations, of course, increases massively, and it also becomes a lot more complex. But it's definitely something we could think about. All right, let's thank the speaker once again.